Hi, thanks for joining us again as we study the book of Numbers in our series, The Wilderness Wanderings. We're in Numbers chapter 21 today. Numbers chapter 21. And we're going to be studying this passage, and I've entitled it Forward by Faith. As the Israelites move forward, it is going to be by faith, and we'll see how that plays out in this in this uh, passage as we study it today. If by chance you uh, are catching up in the series or you're wondering, do we have notes or anything that go with it, we do have those available. You can contact the church office at any time and just get some notes that will be available to follow along in the series as we study. If you're watching this live or in, on the first couple days it's released, we are in a very uh, big national moment. Not really. It's just Super Bowl week. And although that used to be a big deal, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Maybe you haven't watched a single football game this year. I've only watched one. The Bears lost. That's about par for the course, and that's how it is being a Bears fan. We lose all the time. But uh, we look at we look at the Super Bowl, and we get excited to watch. Maybe you just enjoy watching the commercials. Maybe you enjoy watching the game. Maybe one of your teams is in the game, and you're excited. But as I think about football players and I think about their endurance and their resiliency to go out time after time, even when injured, to step onto the gridiron to play, it is is quite an astounding feat. Now, for some teams, unlike mine, which often loses and struggles, some people as fans and as players, you have a confidence in your team. You know that when your quarterback steps onto the field, you're like, we've got this, even if you're down by a number of points. As a fan, you have this confidence that says when Peyton Manning or Drew Brees or maybe back in the day, John Elway or Joe Montana, when they step onto the field, there was a momentum shift. There was a, the other team's worried, your team's excited. As fans, you're like, okay, we're, we're going to be okay. And you could at times watch these men step onto the field and the momentum and the, the tone of the game just completely changed because of their skill. In fact, even, even as much, you may like him, you may not, but Tom Brady is going to be in the Super Bowl again. And you look, and when he steps on the field, I remember watching times, and I'd be like, oh, no, Brady's got two minutes, and he's going to be on the field. We're done for. There was just this momentum, this energy, this excitement that came with these, these men. I mean, you look at Brady. I mean, the guy has had so many come-from-behind wins. They, you know that if there's, they're down, Tampa Bay's down by a couple points this weekend, and if they, uh, they go in and Tom Brady's got time, everybody's expecting him to make the comeback, to make that, to push them forward and to, to move forward. I mean, you can be down 25 points, and he did it a couple years in the Super Bowl and came back and won. And as much as I personally am not a fan of Tom Brady, I have to respect the fact that there is a momentum created on his team. When he steps onto the field, it is there because of who he is as a hard worker, as a student of the game of football, and because of what he's done in the past, people have this confidence in them. And that momentum is key to victory often, and that's why his teams do so well, is that they watch They trust him, and they're going to go forward with him, and they're going to go all in because he is on the field with them. When we get to Numbers chapter 21 in a moment, we're going to see that. There's a belief. There must be a belief that victory can occur, and there must be a willingness by the players to still go out there, even if they're injured, even if they're exhausted. And these players do that time and time again for, for Tom Brady and for other players as well. But in Numbers 21, we're not on a football field, although it is the fourth quarter of the wilderness here. The, the, the children of Israel have been wandering and wandering and wandering, and the momentum is now growing. There's been a victory in chapters, chapter 21 in verses 1 to 3. You see this, this excitement where they commit to the Lord, the Lord gives them victory, and then they're going forward. But all of a sudden, there's a fumble. There's, a, there's discouragement that creeps in. There's complaining that occurred in the next part of Numbers 21 as we looked at last time. And the momentum seems to stop. It seemed like everything was going forward and then there's this hiccup. And what's, what's going to happen? You remember everything that we've studied already in Numbers 21. Israel has dishonored God with their complaining. And because of that, God is going to bring a just judgment upon them with the fiery serpents. And as long as they look to God and live, they will look to the serpent, they will live. But we see that right now at that point, if you were to stop right at this moment where God brings the serpents because of the complaining, that is how the old generation continued to function through the wilderness wanderings. They would complain, 
God would, God would bring some sort of judgment. They would be okay for a little bit. Then they would go back to complaining. But there wasn't this, this change. But now we get this sense with this new generation that there's going to be a new way. That they are not going to just look back and revert to their old ways, but they want to push forward. They want to go forward. And what do they do? Do you remember uh, in uh, earlier, like right around verse uh, 8 or verse 6 of chapter 21, I think it is. Uh, it's verse 7. There we go. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have re- uh, spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. You have the, the children of Israel now transitioning. There's a change that's occurring. They're not functioning like the old generation. There's something new here. They began to turn to repentance, to prayer, to going to God and saying, we have sinned. We have sinned against you. We are wrong. We want to change our direction. We want to repent. And even though there are still consequences that are going to to occur, they are still going to experience the merciful provisions of God through that bronze serpent. As God, God doesn't take away the serpents, but he does provide them for a way to endure the hardship, to endure the hardness. And as they stay repentant and as they focus on God and they focus, they turn to Christ, they were able to, to move forward. Well, what's going to happen? Are we going to go back to the old? Are we going to go back to the new? Is there any momentum that's going to be created to, to move the people forward? And we come to the next section here in Numbers 10, and it really, Numbers is the book of transition and travel. Numbers is a book of transition and travel. Think about these questions here. If we didn't have the book of Numbers, how did, how did Israel get from Mount Sinai to Moab ready to enter into the promised land? Why did it take them 41 years to get only 200 miles? If we don't have the book of Numbers, we don't understand that. Why are Moses and Aaron no longer leading us into the promised land? If you take away Numbers, you don't, you don't know that. It is constantly showing you transition. Can we trust God for the children of Israel going into the promised land? Can they trust God for his providential leading, for his protection, for his provision through uh, into the promised land? Can, can they experience it? How do they know that? If we take out the book of Numbers, we don't know any of that. It provides us with lots of transition. But not only transition, it really does uh, show us the travel. Numbers 21 is the last of the, the travel sections in the book of Numbers. When we finish Numbers 21 this, t- this time, we will be done with any major movement in the book of Numbers. Everything else is going to occur right in what are called the plains of Moab. So Numbers 21 is that final big movement and it's going to be all up and down the east side of the Jordan. That is where they're going to move. But this is the final travel section. They've, Numbers has gotten, uh, gotten us from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, Kadesh Barnea through the wilderness, and now we're up into the plains of Moab, and this will be the final, final time. It's also, Numbers 21 is something very significant. That complaining that occurred is the last time that there is complaining in the book of Numbers. That ought to just right there give us enough for celebration, joy, praising the Lord and saying, finally, it's done. But Israel's learned their lesson. They're, They're moving forward. They're repenting of their sin and they're going forward by faith and trusting God. So we have this transition here in Numbers 21 and this traveling that occurs to move Israel to the place where they're at the doorsteps of the promised land. They are ready to enter in, and God has some some more lessons to teach them, but they are poised to enter the promised land, and that's an exciting time. There is momentum being built. They are moving forward by faith. Having sought the Lord faithfully through the bronze serpent, they are now prepared to faithfully follow God and experience victory through him. They're not looking to themselves now. They are moving forward on this journey, on this trek to the promised land by faith. Unlike their predecessors who rebelled, who did not trust God, who rebelled in, in faith against, his, against him, these individuals are moving forward by faith. Even when they failed, they repented, they turned, and they said, let's go forward. 
Victory is through the Lord. And they, they trusted in God to deliver him. It's, it, I don't know if you've ever read uh, Tolkien's books, the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy or not. Uh, in the two towers, the, the, there's a section where um, the two hobbits are working their way through what are called the dead, the dead marshes. It is just long and excruciating read. And Tolkien does that to make you feel about, feel the long trek, the hardness of the journey. And then all of a sudden, he moves into all this action, all these battle plans and everything that's taking place. And the book seems to, to move all of a sudden and everything starts to unfold. While at first it seems slow and, and tedious. And that's what's happening here in Numbers. If you're like me, we've had some of this repetition. We've had some of these long drawn out passages and you're like, can't we just get to the good stuff? You're like the racehorse that's ready to run out of the gate. And when we get to Numbers 21 here, we're going to have that. Israel does not remain in the quagmire of complaining. They don't sit in the marshes and never move, but rather they're going to move forward. They're going to go and they're now poised to go forward by faith. Look what happens when you look at Numbers 21 verses 10 to 20. You can take any good Bible atlas, map, go pull it up online, check it out. You can go through and follow and chart most of these different cities that are, that are in there. Some, they're not sure where they're at anymore, but you can get a general picture of where and what direction and what route they followed. In fact, on this map here, if you see it, the blue line is basically over on the right there. You'll see this blue line that starts down at the bottom of the map. That is what we're going to experience here in Numbers chapter 21. The movement up and outside all the way around Edom, around a little bit of Moab, and then they're going to go into Ammon and all the way up north into Bashan. And all of these areas are going to be covered in basically 15, 25 verses, 20 verses here. Numbers 21, 10 and 20, it's designed to show God's providential leading and his provision that he is taking them through, that they are following and they are moving forward. The movement from place to place builds momentum. Just like in Tolkien's book where all of a sudden it all happens and you can tell things are happening. Verses 10 to 20 here, it is all about moving, moving, moving. And they camped and they set up and they move forward. They, uh, you'll see those words come up time and time again. They, uh, Israel, verse 10, set forward and pitched or camped in Oboth. And they journeyed from Oboth. And they went uh, in the wilderness, which is before Moab, toward the sun rising. So they were at the east side. Uh, and they removed themselves and pitched in the Valley of Zered. And you just get this constant movement. And you can feel the energy, feel the momentum that is like they're going from here to here to here to here in all, all these places. Every place is moving them closer to where God desired them to be, closer to the entrance to the promised land. Now, they did not know this. They just are following God. They're just going where he's leading, but they're doing it by faith, following and knowing that God is in, in direction and God is in control, and he is telling them and showing them where to go. So by faith, they're marching through and camping all the way up. And every time they're doing that, there is, there is participation that has to be taken place during this endeavor. We took time in, in Numbers 2, 3, 4, all those passages about what would happen when the camp was ready to pack up and to move and how the tabernacle was going to move and how everybody was going to march in place and what direction and, and what position they were going to be in. All of that is taking place every time they're moving. So everyone's participating in this endeavor. Yes, God has appointed that the children of Israel are going to enter into the land but they have obligations. They have things that they have to be doing to get the camp from all the way down to the south by the Red Sea, all the way to the promised land. They had responsibilities that they had to fulfill. So when camp sets out, we've learned a lot, chapters two to four. But look at also in this passage, the various unnamed people that are, that are in this passage but they're all doing different things. Historians in verse 14 are recording the battles in the, in the uh, book of the wars of the Lord. You have recordings that are going on. You have singers singing in verse 17. You have princes digging wells in verse 18. You have diplomats in verse 21. Soldiers are going to go out 23 and 24. You have spies that are going out in verse 32. You have all these people, everybody doing plus all their normal everyday things. This is an active camp. 
They are participating all in moving forward, taking the people and the things that belong to the Lord all the way toward the promised land. And everybody is participating, moving forward by faith to see God's hand at work. So as they go through, we finally see Israel doing what we would have hoped Israel would have been doing from the very beginning. When you think about it, finally, they're trusting, they're obeying God. They're knowing that God is taking them from the, to the land and they're doing what God has called them to do. They are beginning or believing God's promises and actively working out their faith. You have all of this starting to happen and you're looking and saying, man, if this would have only happened, you know, 13 chapters ago, we could have cut out a whole ch chunk of the book of Numbers and we would have been into the promised land already. But we finally have that because they had to learn the lesson that you move forward in life by faith, that it's not in their own power. God's providence is shown through the rapid movement toward the land. We see that happening. God is leading, God is directing, and the people are participating in that. But don't miss God's provisions. Don't miss God's provision in verse 16 at Bear. It's really interesting. Let's, let's look there. Verse 16. It says, And from thence they went to Be'er, that is the well thereof the Lord spake to Mo unto Moses, Gather the people together, and I will give them water. Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well, spring up, sp uh, sing ye unto it. The princes digged the well, the nobles of the people digged it, and by the direction of the lawgiver, with their, which is Moses, with their staves, and from the wilderness that went to Matanah. You have this situation here where it's not uncommon for God to provide water. We've been through that a whole bunch. But note the differences here. First of all, we have God initiating the, the provision of water. He saw their needs. Here's the, these children of Israel. They're walking, they're wandering, they're going to, on, on direct course. They're following God. And God looks and says, hey, they need water. They need something to drink. It's not the people complaining. It's not the people chiding against Moses or against God or doubting God's provision. God sees their faith, sees them actively doing what they're do, supposed to be doing. And what does he do? He provides what they need. Now, it's interesting though. How does he provide? The people are involved in this provision. God has them dig the well. Notice what the song, the song that they sing about this moment says. The princes are digging the wells. The nobles are digging the wells. The people had a responsibility. God said, I'm going to provide for you. There's, there's water here, but you have a responsibility to be working too. You have obligations too. It's not just to sit back and God just do all this for us, but rather they had to, by faith, trust that this is where they're supposed to dig the well. They dig the well and water comes out. The Lord provides the water for his people. But he does it through his people trusting, uh, people's trusting obedience to his word. God provided through people trusting him, doing what he had commanded, living how he expected them to live. And he brings about those provisions and blessings in that way. So you have that unique aspect there in verse 16. Pressing forward by faith, Israel is about to encounter two main obstacles now. They're called Sihon and Og. Now, these may not be household names to you. Okay, you might not, you might not look and say, well, you know, Sihon and Og, yeah, I remember them. You might go, I have never even heard of them. And that's okay. But I'm going to tell you that these two men, these two kings of Ammon, became very well known in Israel's history. We, we look and say, don't, don't really know a lot about them, but they appear no less then 15 times in other passages of Scripture. They're again in Numbers 32, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Joshua, 1 Kings, Nehemiah. Uh, they show up in the Psalms. The, the children of Israel, these, the, what happens here in the next 15 verses has great impact upon not only the children of Israel and their confidence in God and their ability to move forward by faith, but it also has impact upon others outside of the, the children of Israel. They hear of what happens with Sihon and Og, and, and it causes some trembling. And so we may not know their, know their names you know, off the top of our head, but it's, it would do us really well to learn quickly what happened here. 
what was going on. So this new generation is important. They're not intimidated by the show of force from another power, from another people, because they are pressing forward by faith in God, that he is their provider, that he is their protector, that he is providentially leading. And if he is saying, go this way, then we are going to go this way. If he brings this into our hardships, then we are going to endure because God has allowed it into our lives. And so they press forward into the situation. We get to verse 11. And as we get to verse 11, Israel is going to send messengers. They're going to send diplomats to Sihon. Moses is going to try the diplomatic approach that he tried earlier with Edom. And as he sends them there, they're just asking, can we go up through the King's Highway, which is the main route through that area? Can we just go up that way? We won't take anything. Anything we do take, we will purchase, we will buy. We're not going to just plunder you. We just want to go through safely. Would you allow us to do that? And Sihon is going to refuse. But why does he refuse? In order to understand that, let's flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2, and we're going to be in Deuteronomy 2 and 3 and Numbers 21 back and forth. So if you want to stick something in your Bible just as an extra place marker there, that would be fine. Deuteronomy chapter 2. When we get down in this passage, we're going to see that in verse 30, but Sion, the king of Heshbon, which is Heshbon is the main, the capital city, so to speak, in his region, but it's his city, would not let us pass by him. For the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that, we, that he may deliver him into thy hand as a period that day. So God is involved in this. God is like he did with Pharaoh to, to harden his heart. God hardens the spirit of Sion. Sion pushes against him. He becomes obstinate. He's like, I'm not going to give in to you. In fact, we're going to come out and we're going to go to battle with you. Why did God do this? God did it to demonstrate to his people that I can deliver you and I will deliver you uh, from the hands of the enemy. This would then bolster, it would motivate them to understand that God is protecting them, that God has their back, that he is conquering for them, that he is the one who is really fighting, not them in their own strength, but by the Lord's power, by the Lord's strength. And that is who they were to, to, to fight in the name of the Lord as they, as they went forward. So what do we know about Siam? What do we, what do we learn about him? The Lord is going to tell Moses in verse 31, he says to him, the Lord said, behold, I have begun to give Sihon and his land before thee. So, so God says, I'm giving you Sihon, but you're going to have to fight. I'm giving you the land, but you must begin. Notice the next word in verse 31. Begin to possess that thou mayest inherit the land. God doesn't just say, I'm just going to wipe them all out for you. He says, you have to step out by faith. You must enter into the battle. You must go. You must do this. You have to begin to possess the land. You have a responsibility. Faith is not just sitting back and just whatever God does, God does, and I'm just going to blah, sit, and just waddle through life. Faith requires obligation. Faith requires activity by me. Faith requires me to do what God has told me to do. And trusting that God, when I do what he tells me to do, God will bless, God will deal, and God will have things done the way that he desires and de determines. God delivers Sihon and the Ammonites, or the Amorites, excuse me, Ammonites are different people, Amorites into the hand of Israel. Verse 33, it says that then, Sion came out against him, he and all his people, to fight at Jehez. And the Lord, our God, delivered him before us, and we smote him and his sons and all his people. So they defeat this great warrior. Sion is known as a great warrior. We'll see that in a second back in Numbers 21. He is a, he is a powerful man. And yet they utterly destroyed his cities. You see, see that, um, we learned that last time about the utter destruction. At the middle of verse 34, they utterly destroyed the men and the women and the little one in every city and we left none to remain. So there was a ban that took place on the city and on the people. But God allows something a little bit different than the last time we saw. He allows them to experience um, the blessings of victory. As they, they won, they were able to keep some of the, the spoils, the cattle, the gold, the silver. They, they were able to keep them. So now the people are not only conquering land, not only are they going forward, but they're starting to experience some of the, the foretold blessings of the promised land. They are starting to gain and gather 
Well, God said, I'm going to give you land that you didn't, you didn't really do anything to, but I'm going to give it to you. You're going to receive these spoils of war. And God blesses them in the victory as they move forward by faith in their life. And they say in verse 36, for the Lord, our God has delivered us. He is the one. They recognize that this was not in their own strength. This is their first real military battle. They're, they're new at this, and yet God delivered them. And they recognized that it was God who delivered us, that there was not a city that was too strong. They said, All right, he's our protector. But notice that verse, verse 36, and we'll, get it, we'll do it again. I'll show you in Numbers 21. Important to highlight, there was not one city too strong for us. It's important. And the Amorites were known for their fortified cities, for the strength of their walls. They were known for the power and might of these, these cities that they had, including Heshbon, which was the science home, his capital. Now they went there. If you go back to Numbers 21 and verse 24, it says there, and, and our King James just has was strong, but the idea is that it was a for, they were fortified. Israel smote with the edge of the sword and possessed his land, talking about science, from Arnon unto Jabbok, even the children of Ammon, for the border of the children of Ammon was strong. And Israel took all these cities. These fortified, strong cities were no match for God and for the children of Israel. Now that's going to play into to something here in just a moment. Israel takes all of them. Now they go and they even take the mighty city Heshbon. Verses 27 to 30, really weird verses to have to interpret and work through. But basically what it is, is it's a song. Whether the song was one of the Amorites that was adapted by the, changed around by the Israelites, or what many think is a song that Israel just created about it. It's basically looking and saying, there's the mighty city Heshbon, the mighty city Heshbon. We have raised it. We've burned it. The city that belonged to Sion, that great warrior, the one who came into Moab and conquered all these lands, the one who went through and wiped out everybody. We have conquered them. And that city is now decimated. It is laid to waste. And they say, we need to rebuild it. We need to, it's perished, but we need to, we need to, we need to bring it back up. And it's interesting in how it all plays out. Heshbon did fall. It was the home of Zion. It was a great city and he was a, it was a great warrior. And yet they look and say, we crushed it. It's not there anymore. It has been burned. It has been raised to the ground and it is done. But it was so strategic that they wanted to say it needed to be rebuilt. And in fact, it did get rebuilt. As we, as we get into Joshua, Joshua 21 verse 39, Heshbon actually becomes a Levitical city for Merari, one of the clans in, in the tribe of Levi. They, that it becomes a city, a, a Levitical city for them. It is a, a great city and they, they did rebuild it. But look what they do in verse 31 and 32. It says, after, after Heshbon has fallen in all these lands, thus Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites and Moses sent to spy out Jazir, which actually Jazir becomes a Levitical city too as well in the same passage. Um, and they took the villages thereof and drove out the Amorites that were there. Israel has absolutely no problem driving out the Amorites as they followed God and as they trusted in his deliverance and his direction through the land. And they wiped them out. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you remember back in Numbers 14, what, was, what were some of the fears that stopped the first generation from going into the promised land? Do you remember what they said in Numbers 13, 28 to 33? The people are great. They're mighty. They're, they're strong. They're warriors. The cities, the cities are walled and very great. What, did, what just happened? What happened with all these great fortified, strong cities? None were able to stand against the Lord and the people and children of Israel as they went forward by faith. God just showed he could deal with those cities and he would. But do you remember the other one? They said there are giants in the land and we're like little grasshoppers and, and we, we're, gonna, we're gonna be destroyed by them. Well, in the passage in Numbers 21, this first battle with Sion shows that these fortified cities, these great warriors, 
They are nothing to God. When we face all our hardships and battles, God is in control and he can handle them. But what about the giants in the land? Look at what happens in the next, the next section of the verse, verse 33 to 35. And they turned and went up by the way of Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, went on against them, he and all his people, to the battle at Adrai. So Israel's faith moved them forward through the land of the Amorites on their way to the borders in the north to Bashan. And as they moved north, there is a potential of fear that is going to occur. Now, Numbers doesn't give us the full-blown details of why there's potential fear, but we do know that God looks at Moses in verse 32 and says, fear him not. Who's the him? It's Og, the king of Bashan. He says, don't you be afraid of him. I, I'm going to take care of you. Now, as they moved further north, up to this area called Adrai, where the city was where they were going to battle, Og doesn't even give the opportunity for diplomacy. He comes out to meet them in battle and warfare because he is a warrior. He is a, he is a champion of champions. He is ready to fight. And I'm sure, truthfully, we're probably spread of what has all happened because Sihon and Og are called the two kings of the Amorites. So there may be a north and south. Maybe there was a division. Maybe there wasn't a united aspect, but he, he's heard Sihon is gone. He's probably heard the, the, the decimation of all these fortified cities. He's not going to let them come to his city. He's going to go out and meet it head on. He is the warrior. He's not going to sit back. He's going to drive forward and, and take care of this. So Og meets Israel at a dry, and God tells Moses not to fear in verse 34. Specifically, he says, do not fear him. So God, don't, don't follow, don't fear Og. I know he's a warrior. I know he's strong, but I will do to him as I did to Sion. And it's interesting that past victories even the recent past victories or long past victories enable us to push through some giant obstacles, enable us to steer things, stare down the fear that we have and have courage that God has us, that God is in control, that God has our back. He provides, he protects, he leads, and we're going to trust him for that in the, in the wanderings of life. But Deuteronomy 3 gives us more insight, which helps us to, to put this in perspective. So flip back to Deuteronomy 3. Deuteronomy 3, we're going to have the situation with Og a little bit in a little bit more detail. That when they went up in verse 1, they turned. Verse 2, we see the, the same thing that he has just said. Do not fear him. God's going to deliver Og and his people in verses 3 to 5. Verse 2 says, fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand, just like I did to, to, with Sihon. So he's like, you're going to be okay. So the Lord God, verse 3, delivered into our hands Og, also the king of Bashan and all his people, and we smote him until none was left in the remaining. And you're going to see the same thing that happened with Sihon happened with Og. The people are, they face the ban, the city faces the ban. All of that is destroyed, but the people are allowed once again to, uh, to enjoy the plunder, verse 7, the, the spoils that is there. So you see the utter destruction, verse 6, the spoils in verse 7. But I want to ask you a question. Do you remember how tall Goliath was? I know it seems like a completely random question, but when we think giant, when we think big guy in the Bible, we instantly think Goliath, right? First Samuel 17 tells us that Goliath was six and a half cubits tall. It was six, six cubits in a span, six and a half. Or in other words, he's about nine and a half feet tall. So we instantly think Goliath. Now, I want you to go a little bit further in this passage. Go down to verse 11. When they plunder the city, look at, look at Og's bed. Verse 11 says, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold his bed stand, his bed of iron was made of iron. And look at what it says. Is it not in Rabbath, the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it after the cubit of a man. Og's bed was quite large, 13 and a half feet long, six feet wide, 
if you give him just maybe about a foot or so, so he can about normal proportions with a head, uh, with a bed, many believed he was between 11 and 12 feet tall. The, the little image there on the side, though it's not clear, is the proportion of Goliath to Og. Now, that's not even talking normal human being looking up. That's Goliath looking up to this guy. And Goliath looks up to him. What do you think Moses and the children of Israel are doing? He's all the way up there. Is there potential for fear? Did the first generation fear the giants in the land? Absolutely. What does God tell him? Go forward. You start to take, I have given this man into your hand. I have delivered him to you. And what happens? This great, massive warrior and all of his people are decimated because the children of Israel stepped forward and pushed through by faith. They trusted in God, unlike their predecessors. They said, we are going to go forward. We are going to trust. He was a giant. There were giants in the land, but what does God do in Numbers 21? He shows the people of Israel Yes, you were worried about the fortified cities. Yes, you were worried about the great people. Yes, you were worried about the giants in the land. But in 15 verses, he says, I've got all of that. In 15 verses, he takes the entire east, eastern side of the, the, Jordan, uh, the Jordan River, the Transjordan side. And it, it takes him no time. Because God is able to deliver. God conquers. God is our victory. God is the one that we can put our trust in. And that's what happens here. In all of the difficulties, in all of the dire circumstances, in all of the disappointments, in all of the dilemmas encountered by the, on the way to the promised land by the other generation, this generation chose to learn from them and press forward by faith. They don't dismiss that they happen, but they learn from those past experiences and said, we're going to trust in God. We're going to do it differently. We're going to put our confidence in the midst of all of the difficulties. We're going to go forward by faith. In the midst of pandemics, we're going to go forward by faith. In the midst of sickness, we're going to go forward by faith. In the midst of dilemmas that whatever God brings, we're going to go forward by faith. We are going to put our trust in God. We're going to put it to action. We don't simply start with faith. Oh, I put my trust in Jesus. I put my trust in God. And then we move forward the rest of our lives just trusting in ourselves and in our own efforts and doing our own thing and doing it our way. That is not faith. I am to work out my salvation, Paul tells me, with fear and trembling. I am to continually be working toward and doing what God has demanded and commanded of me. I am to push forward by trusting in God. When we talk about forward by faith, when we talk about faith in this passage of all of Numbers 21, faith is more than merely the first step in our journey with God. It's not just, okay, we're just gonna, we're just gonna walk. It is a daily consistent battle to say, I am going to put on faith as part of my armor because I need that. I need to put my confidence and my trust in God and his provisions and his protection and his providences, wherever they may lead. I am going to trust in him. It is part of our journey all along. It is not just great. I got saved and now I can do whatever I want to do and be whatever I want to be. No, I am by faith day by day, trusting in God's word and what God's word says. Faith is committed to repentance. They turned from their, their sin and they were following after God. They kept their eyes focused on him. They looked to Jesus and lived. They turned away from what they did. And we as individuals, we are going to battle with sin. We are going to fall and it is going to happen, but I must be committed. Re repentance doesn't look back. It does for a moment. It looks at the sin and says, this was wrong. What I did was wrong, but I'm going to live by faith and I'm going to move forward and I'm going to trust in what God has said and what God is doing and that he has forgiven me and that I can move forward in my, my life. Though repentance initially looks back upon sin, it is moving forward by faith in God's forgiveness. And that's what they did. They didn't wallow and say, we blew it. We, we complained just like our forefathers I guess we'll just die by the serpents and maybe the next generation will get to go. 
No, they repented and they moved forward by faith. Faith rests in God's provisions, in his protections, in his providential leading. As I wake up in the morning, Lord, I have to trust in you. And Lord, help me to have faith in you today. That what you do, that what you bring about, you are good. You are always good. And you are, um, you're always good to me. God is always good in all, in all ways. And so we, we look and we say, okay, I'm going to trust in him. Faith is not passive. And I think this is a, a, a big dynamic that you see implicitly apply, implied through numbers, but specifically here. It's not only a passive thing where, okay, I accepted Christ as my savior and now I sit back. There is an active element of my faith, of your faith, that as we go, God is sovereign, but we have responsibility. Israel had the responsibility to take the lamb which God had given them. He said, I've given it to you, but you've got to do your part. I have blessings for you, but you must actively live out your faith. You must, you must be righteous. He's the source of, the, of provision and success. We have the responsibility to follow in trust and obedience, to, to do what God has. I cannot be expecting God to bless my life and be living in complete disobedience to him. I cannot, I cannot expect God to bring comfort and blessings in my life if I refuse to trust in him. I have to daily be trusting and obeying my father. Faith endures in the face of difficulties. We want to move forward? There are going to be difficulties. We're going to face hardships. We are facing difficulties and hardships. And yet I have to face them with faith. To look at the giants. To look at the walled cities. To look at the mighty people around. And endure the difficulty. Why? Because Christ says that I can because I can do it through him who gives me strength. I can trust in him that he is going to help, that he is going to. I, I can go through and I can, I can capture death, fortified cities, giants. They, faith gracefully perseveres through hardship. I don't know what your hardships are. I know what mine are. I may know some of yours, but I know this, that God expects us to gracefully endure hardship. And that's not easy. And yet he says we can do that. Faith gives God the glory in our lives. When we live by faith, when we push forward, we have opportunities to glorify the name of God. You have this with, they praise God for the provisions at the well. They praise God for his victories at Heshbon. They sing the songs. Even have in Joshua 9, which we won't go there, but in Joshua 9, the Gibeonites they have heard, and they have heard specifically what happened with Sihon and Og. And they, they figure out a way with Joshua to strike up peace with the God of victory. They look and they say, we, we don't want anything to do with this. They figured out a way to, to have peace. And they specifically say, we have heard of the name of the Lord your God. And we have heard what he has done to Sihon and Og. He's strong. He is mighty. He delivers you, and we don't want to go up against him. The name of the Lord was exalted. When we live by faith, when we endure hardships with faith, with trust, with obedience, when we look at the difficulties of life and we handle them with grace, God gets the glory. And it provides opportunities for us to exalt the name of Christ, to share the good news of the gospel because of how we walk by faith. So as we look at the passage, may we move forward by faith in all the trials, all the tribulations we face in our wilderness by trusting in the one who guides who provides, and the one who fights for us. Father, I pray that you would help us to trust in you. Lord, help me, help those who are listening to move forward in our lives by faith, to not sit in a quagmire, to not be content with our sin, but to repent and to move forward. Help us to, to go through our hardships and our difficulties gracefully, knowing that you are in control and that you bring victory and you have given us the strength to be able to endure. Lord, help us to live by faith. Help us to move forward in our life, forward by faith. For it's in your name we pray, amen. Thanks so much. Have a great day.